Happy New Year, everybody. It's 2024. We're so happy to be with you in another year on Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Our first episode of the year today is going to be breaking down our favorite films from 2023. 2023 is the best year since 2019 for film. And lockdown changed cinema and changed movie, the movie going experience, but we're getting back on our feet. I know the money for box office is still down, but in terms of releases and the quality of films, since 2019, I can't think of a better year. That includes 2020, 2021, and 2022. 2023 has been outstanding, and I can't wait to get into this list. It was very hard to iron this down to 20 films, but we did the best we could. We're also going to talk about the five worst movies of 2023, as well as some honorable mentions, movies that didn't quite make our list, but I'm excited to get into it. And again, thank you for tuning into Raiders of the Lost Podcast, everybody. Let's get into You said it. how well the box office is down, you said. Yeah. We'll never get to 2018, 2019 box office in the history of cinema. I mean, those are insanely inflated years with the Avengers films and superhero movies. That's a great point. Killing. Even though everyone's always going to say like, oh, we're still down from 2018, 2019. We'll never hit that peak again. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah. ever. I guess the question is, are we down from like 2016, 2017? That's more realistic because I mean, I get, yeah, that's the, that's Avengers a Endgame made a billion dollars in a weekend. <laughs> yeah. So it's those two years, 2018, 2019 specifically, obviously the two best years ever. And we had, a, I think it's 15 years in a row of the best box office annually. The inflation of superheroes created the massive box office of it was like 46 billion wow. per, for the year or something like that i think or, or maybe not that much maybe it was it was an absurd number but you know a lot of that's coming from superhero movies and specifically three of them four of them in a two-year span and plus i mean marvel just onslaught of the just some of the best superhero movies we've seen with 2018 2019 and the culmination of everything they built everybody saw those movies yeah so. and we had three movies approaching a billion or over a billion this year and we still didn't come close to 2019's box office so i think we'll never hit the box offices of those two magical years ever again but that doesn't mean that we're they're not still successful yeah. years at the at the movies now james did you make a new year's resolution for 2024 i did not i never do make a new year's resolution i Neither don't really do I. I don't I never, really believe yeah. in them then why I, would you ask me that i'm just curious oh yeah because it's the new year's i didn't know day. if you did it i just know i don't i do don't it. i don't really believe in them because i feel like if you're making a new year's resolution you're in your in advance for the future for like oh in a week i'm gonna start this that means you're gonna fail eventually because you are putting part, it off you have a yeah. higher probability of not pulling off what you're trying to do whether it's you know getting to the gym or doing a project whatever it is if you put it off until a specific date oh i'll start on january 1st you're more likely to fail eventually yeah i always think like if you want to do a resolution why not just start it right now exactly whatever day it is i don't like them i don't <laughs> like new year's resolutions yeah i've never done it I, I think i've tried one but I've ne it's never stuck and i've just never been someone to be like i'm going to start doing this on this date it's ne never been for me. Maybe more of a general for 2024, not just New Year's resolution 2024. I'm going to, you know, drink less or eat better or <laughs> eat more food or eat more fast food, whatever it is. <laughs> My, every, it's always the same for me every year is trying to find a balance between eating right, eating healthy and eating bad every <laughs> single year. That's the challenge. Well, I'm doing okay. But I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with making a New Year's resolution. I'm sure. Yeah, it's of just you not did. for you. When you were younger, it was a thing that was like, I have to make my New Year's resolution. I feel like or else in school, it won't they come pushed true. it. Yeah. yeah, or else it wouldn't come true, or you wouldn't <laughs> succeed. <laughs> it's just something to do, I think, and to talk about. Yeah. If you have a New Year's resolution and you didn't start it, well, you would have started it by now. But <laughs> honestly, just do it when you get the idea to do it in December or whatever. I I, I forgot to add up how many movies I saw this year. 47 million i can look it up well i can actually grab it on the letterbox stats have you logged every single movie because i didn't start logging movies until i think it was april well i took over the letterbox at the beginning in the early months of 2023 i just took over so we'll see i think um on the stats page we weren't really using letterbox very well it wasn't for a until mid 2023 where we, be we became regular users of letterbox yeah but we're, we're very we're, late to the app but we're on it now we're doing we've it every day. we've been busy with other apps. <laughs> okay, so I had 391 diary entries, so 391 films seen, with uh, 806 hours worth of footage of movies watched. I don't know what. Hold, on, let me see. Let me see what mine. You need is. to be a patron to have the stats. Oh, I'm a patron. Oh, nice. Uh, I I pay. I change the posters and everything, Anthony. Now I average 32 movies per Anthony's month. Assuming I can't afford Patreon <laughs> patron. <laughs> I average 32 movies per month, which is 7.5 per week. The first movie I watched this year was The Triangle of Sadness, and the last movie I watched this year, we're actually recording right before the new year, so I'm probably going to watch a couple other movies, um, but some my, some of my milestones were, uh, the 50th movie I watched was Born Supremacy, 
100th movie I watched was Christ Stopped at Eboli. The 200th movie I watched was The Third Man. 250th was Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. 350th was LA Confidential. The 300th movie I watched was Halloween. I love these facts. Where do you get that information? My first the stats page. I'm on in my diary. Bottom. My first logged movie was Air on April 3rd, Air. 2023. So that's when I started really using my mm-hmm. letterbox. My last logged movie is Ferrari. So where do you go? You go to stats on the bottom of your page. Stats. Oh, I see that. I so see the stats. My most watched actors were Brad Pitt with 11 films. Not a bad way to spend a year. <laughs> uh, Tom Cruise, no surprise, with 10 films. Matt Damon with 10 films. And Willem Dafoe, nine films I watched of his. And my most watched directors were Ridley Scott with 10. Steven Spielberg with nine films I watched. Scorsese, I watched seven of his films. And then Richard Linklater, I watched five of his films. So those are my top five directors watched. All right, so since I started logging on April 3rd, 2023, I have 194 entries for wow. movies. I have 400.9 hours clocked of watching cinema. My, what else did you say? My milestones, let's see. Like I said, most watched was Oppenheimer four times, Chamber of the Secrets, Chamber of Secrets three times. The Chamber of the Secrets. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other stuff you said? Okay, stars, Alan Rickman, Tom Felton, the whole, <laughs> the whole Potter the cast. The whole Harry Potter cast. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my most watched actors and actresses. <laughs> oh my god, that's pretty funny. That's amazing. Sixteen uh, watches for each of them. <laughs> directors: I have Martin Scorsese at five films, David Yates four films, Ridley Scott four films, Denis Villeneuve, Spielberg four films. All right, cool. My most liked review was my Oppenheimer review, which which had a thousand one hundred and seventy seven likes. My, that was also my likes. most liked review. Damn, that's a lot. I didn't even realize. Let's see how many likes it had. I want to see two hundred eight hundred sixteen likes. Whoa. Damn, that's a lot of likes, man. Highs and lows. I had the lowest av- the the film that had the lowest score on Letterbox that I watched this year was Doom. Same. And the highest rated film on Letterbox that I watched this year was Twelve Hard Angry Curry. Men at four point oh. six. Let me finish the sentence. I was trying to see if we were the same. Twelve Angry Men at four point six. Doom was a two point zero. Yeah, two point zero. Hara Kiri was my most highest rated movie that I watched. Rated higher than average. I rated The Flash a four and a half. I had a good time. Maybe I should. So yeah, I rated the Flash four and a half, and then I rated Tenet five, and then Born Supremacy. I rated higher than average. My lowest rated movie of the year, I think it was either Fast X is a one and a half. I think I gave Renfield a one. (laughs) Anyways, I know I love this. We know not everyone has a litter box, so let's get into our episode of our twenty favorite films of twenty twenty three. This is a biased list. It's our subjective opinions and we so, put our lists together so this is like we had to agree on the order so it's a mega list yeah, it's a super list it's, it's a definitely list it's a transformer list <laughs> prime we, we put our lists together would you like to get into the what we think were the five worst movies first absolutely i would love to talk about those okay it was uh as many great films as we had in 2023 there were some pretty awful ones now and this is if you enjoyed these movies it's no big deal. Then you enjoy. Here we them. go. James play good cop. I'm trying to just keep <laughs> the peace, good, man. Good cop, bad cop Try. routine. Here we go. <laughs> the good cop, if you bad like cop it, it's routine. Okay, We're, I don't. I don't want you to be offended if we didn't like it. Never start with the head. The victim gets all fuzzy. They can never feel the other attack. <laughs> all right, let's start off with the, probably the most ridiculous movie I've ever seen. It's, it's up there with Fast X. It's funny because I had only seen the first three. And then I got into this one, no problem at all, because the story's so simple. I can't I believe like, they still live in Echo Park, Los Angeles. I can't by believe the way. they still live in Echo Park. Yeah, in Angelino Heights, they still live there. Super secret agents, and they're living in the Angelino Heights in LA. Enemies around the world, international enemies. My God! But uh, the the movie's out of control. The story's ridiculous. The cast, I mean, the cast is stacked, but like I found it to be. So I hadn't. I I, I enjoyed the first three. I, I do. I do like them. I just never got it. I just it was just never my thing, but I found the movie to be like for as successful as they are, it wasn't that entertaining. Uh, the comedy didn't work. It was actually kind of cringe comedy, especially Luda and, and Tyrese. <laughs> so I was like, are these guys supposed to be the comedic relief? Because they're not making me laugh at all. Uh, cinematography is pretty me- pretty bad. CGI is all over the place. Like not that great CGI. They made Italy look <clears throat> terrible. Momoa was like insane. I was like, this is not where <laughs> it's too much. He's dialed too much to eleven. And then, I mean, the entire Rome sequence with the giant ball rolling down, it just never stops rolling through the entire city. Makes no sense. Made no sense. And then blowing up the Hoover Dam with Dom driving down it as it's exploding in his charger. 
and then parking at the base of the Hoover Dam and looking up at it as it's on fire and cutting to black. I was like, that, it cut to black, and I was like, what the fuck just happened? Absolutely it's, ridiculous. It's getting outrageous, and they're still making profit. This one made like $850 million at the global box office. My God. So it still made profit. It needed to hit about $800 million to become <laughs> successful because yeah, it's such an expensive movie. And, I mean, it's one of those movies where while I'm watching it, I'm like, this is terrible. But also, I kind of respect the filmmakers. They're literally just... When you're a kid and you're just, you're just smashing toy cars against the wall and just racing yeah. with your friends with like the toy cars and you're like going up walls. That's what they're making a movie as. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of respect it to the extent they're like, fuck it. Who gives a <laughs> fuck? Let's make a crazy, ridiculous action movie with a $300 million budget. And people still ins- people are still seeing them. And it is a 2.5 currently on Letterboxd. It's so. absurd that a 2.5 on Letterboxd is making that much money at the box office. Man, it's rid- it was ridiculous. All right, moving on to our next one, James. Rebel Moon, which I haven't watched because Anthony has told me he held a gun to my head. He said, don't watch Rebel Moon. Don't, don't watch it, man. Promise me you won't watch it. Promise me you won't watch Rebel Moon. And I, well, I haven't watched it at all since. So I gave Rebel Moon a 2.5 on Letterboxd. I gave it that half star just because I love Zach. But, man, this is a 2.1 currently on Letterboxd. Very uninteresting story. Very cliche characters and dialogue kind of like eye rolling kind of story too and it was the story was just like not that interesting and on top of that it was just like the cgi was a little much the action scenes for a Zack snyder film weren't even that great and it was like the choreography was kind of clunky and it's like i have a problem with fight choreography when bad guys just run up to the hero to get beat up <laughs> you know? yeah me too they just run up to get when they have a laser gun but they're gonna run up to the to the hero so they can get beat like beat down it's like if they all just stood back and shot at her, she'd be dead. But, I mean, it's, a mo- it's like, fight choreography like that drives, just drives me nuts sometimes. But the movie was just, like, so, so boring, too. It took me two days to finish it. And for Zack Snyder films, I gotta put it at the bottom of his list. It really is Whoa. not very good at all. And all of, his, all of his other movies are better. Even Batman vs. Superman, which I'm not a huge fan of. And Sucker Punch? I like Sucker Punch. Yeah, I, like Sucker I think Punch Sucker too. Punch is really cool. I enjoy Sucker Punch. Yeah, but I, would you before this you would have ranked Batman vs Superman at the bottom of Zack Snyder movies? Probably. List? I'm, I just never liked Batman vs Superman. I thought it had some cool moments, but um, the story and then Martha, <laughs> the whole thing. Just, Martha, Martha. What was her name? Who's Martha? Martha. <laughs> I, I have a mom named Martha too. Martha, me too, man. Whoa. Martha. <laughs> Did we just become best friends? <laughs> like that whole that whole plot trajectory was like. In the theater, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, but the fight is so good. The fight's great, yeah. It's so cool, man. Okay, maybe, I, all right, I'll, I'll maybe be a little more generous to the Batman ba- The Superman. Batman and Superman fighting is the sickest shit ever, yeah. man. But, I mean, I love 300. I really like Dawn of the Dead. And I like Man of Steel so much. So he's and made Watchmen's some, great. Watchmen's great. So he's made some movies that I really love. Yeah, me too, me too. So, yeah. Man, just just skip Rebel Moon. The next worst movie of 2023 was what I put at the bottom of my list, Renfield. This movie was just everything I didn't want it to be. It was really disappointing. I was excited to see Nick Cage's Dracula. He looks like he had a great time. And he looks like he would be a good Dracula in a good Dracula movie. He was good in the movie. Yeah. But this movie is just so poorly written. So, so the misdirection, the direction is so confusing. <laughs> There's just green light everywhere. There's red light everywhere. It wants to be John Wick with the the aesthetic, but it just makes zero sense because we're in a basketball court at a at a group therapy session and everything's green. It just makes no goddamn fucking sense. <laughs> it's not like John Wick in a club. And Renfield, played by Nicholas Holt, he's such a talented actor, but he's really wasted in this forgettable role. The production design is straight up ugly in this movie. It makes it's just. It's just, it looks like someone puked crayons everywhere. Like a whole Crayola crayon set just everywhere, all over the walls. Like his apartment is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. And it's the sweaters he wears in this movie, he is such a pussy in this movie <laughs> until he eats bugs. And then he's this hero. It's a superhero movie, essentially. Aquafina's storyline is a cop with her sister who's in the FBI. It is cringe dialogue. Awful. awful. It is network TV dialogue. And then the mob family. The mob with, with Ben, ben Schwartz. Schwartz. I'm like, what is going his, on with this movie? And his mom. I'm like, what is this? I was like, is this a Dracula movie? They what run the, the whole fuck? city and they have the entire Corrupt police force police. on their payroll except for Aquafina. It's just, 
it's just not a good movie. I, I know some people enjoyed it, but I I couldn't get. I fortunately, or unfortunately, we had to sit in the theater and watch this, so we couldn't leave. We and Nick Cage introduced the movie. I was yeah. so amped up. I was so excited about this movie. Nick Cage there. He opened up the screening. He was really funny. He and gave cool. us a massage. Too. Yeah, <laughs> ten feet in front of us. I'm like, it's fucking Nick Cage. I'm like, let's go Renfield. Within three minutes, I'm like, oh Jesus fucking Christ, this, this is, is this what movie. we're in for. It was a very cringe movie. This is the best. And it was a huge bomb, huge waste of money. They put 90 mil into this. Oh. It grossed, like, I think 15 or 20. It probably lost the studio $100 million at least because factoring in marketing, factoring in movie theater ticket sales, getting half the cuts. It was a huge miss. And it is a 2.9 on Letterboxd. That's I, way too high. Yeah, I gave it two and a half just because I gave it the half star of Bubba 2 because it had some good gore and some good bloody stuff. But it's the. It's, it's, the great sequences were too few and far between, and it was just like it was so over the top. I, it was an anticipated movie for me. Yeah, but then Dracula movie coming out is it April? I think it just made no sense, and I think that we clearly know why. Yeah, man, they're just trying Damn. to get a little box office because they knew it was gonna bomb. Whew. Oh my god, what a what a movie! All right, moving on to the next worst movie of the year, we have sixty five, written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, the filmmakers behind. A Quiet Place Part 1, the original draft of that. I gave this movie a two and a half stars. It has a 2.2 on Letterboxd. And it's Adam Driver versus Dinosaurs. And you'd be surprised how little Adam Driver versus Dinosaurs there is in the movie. <laughs> I feel like it's on our worst movies of 2023 because of the massive potential of this movie. We were ecstatic to see a new dinosaur yeah. movie from a studio that's not universal. They've had a monopoly on the genre for a while. Adam Driver... In an action movie, fighting dinosaurs, hell yeah. yeah, sign us up. We were ju juiced for this movie. Within five minutes again, oh, this is going to be that kind of a movie. Yeah, it was just—it was all about, it's just a story and the writing. And it was just very mediocre script, cringe dialogue, uninteresting characters, and then a complete lack of really any kind of dinosaur action sequences. There, There's a couple of cool moments, but for the most part, it was just mostly just Adam Driver and the lead actress just... Walking around the woods for an hour and a half, doing nothing. And I was like, what, is anything going to happen they in this movie? can't communicate because they speak different languages, It's which I understand, I guess. It was, a, it was hard to sit through, honestly. It was tough. I was so disappointed by it, but we had to sit through it, and we, we finished the whole thing, of course. And I know, I, I love dinosaurs, too. That's the thing. And, and I've been Everybody so loves dinosaurs. I've been pretty yeah. disappointed by the last two Jurassic World movies, so I was very excited. I, I thought they were going to pull this off, and... It's an interesting idea. He plays a character from space, from a different space. galaxy, different who's planet. human, but... Yeah, it's a different planet of humans. It, it, he's a human billions of years ago on a different planet, which also kind of makes no and sense. They speak to English. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> it's kind of, actually, it makes no fucking sense. And then he crash lands on Earth, obviously, 65 billion years ago. Million years ago. Billion. 65 billion. Yeah, Wait, no, million. No, it's billion. No, Earth's only 11 billion years old. 65 million, million. years ago. Yeah. That's the hook. That's the catch, but they spoil it within a minute. Yeah. And obviously, they spoil it in the trailers. I thought it was it, like if you dr if you dress it up like an alien movie, then you punch everybody in the face with the surprise of it being dinosaurs 65 million years ago on Earth. That would have been sick. That's yeah. the that's the yeah. catch. Yeah. They blew it. They they had this great they blew secret it. that you they could have. But they tell you right away in the <laughs> opening. They tell you what's going on. It's like this is a great. You could have hidden this. It would have been a great surprise. Yeah. And it's just not executed very well. Two survivors from this ship crash. Obviously, they're not going to die. Yeah. They're going to... Zero the, stakes. The dinosaurs are not going to kill them. They're the only I, characters in the movie. When they were the two survivors, I was like, okay, these two are definitely going to make it out at the end. There's no point in making the movie if they both die. So even if there were some interesting dinosaur sequences, there's no fear for life. No fear for loss there's of no life. There's no stakes. A absolutely. You had to have characters that got killed by dinosaurs. That's the thing. It was a dinosaur... Humans versus dinosaurs movie. And not a single human was killed by a dinosaur in the movie. It made no sense. There's a lot yeah. of things like the tech made no sense. For protection, he surrounds themselves with motion sensor detectors. You would think they would have a language um, interpretation tech. I guess not. <laughs> They're not. Want to hear a crazy dinosaur fact? Yeah. So, Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex were as, uh, were as far apart time-wise as we are to T-Rex. That's pretty wild. So, we're, we were closer in time to the T-Rex... Then the T-Rex was the Stegosaurus. 
It's pretty wild. Isn't that fucking crazy? That's how long dinosaurs dominated the earth. You know what else is a crazy fact? What? Of the hundreds of millions of years that dinosaurs were on earth, he happens to crash land the day before the oh asteroid takes out the dinosaurs. Oh my God. <laughs> what a coincidence. Oh my God. What a coincidence. When they showed the asteroid in the sky, I was like, my eye roll was so deep. I was like, oh, here we go. I think we, we talked about this, you know, Universal makes bank off the Jurassic World movies, and we think that Sony's like, do we have a dinosaur script? Let's go with it. I think that's what happened. Is there anything with dinosaurs? All right, let's move on to the final worst film of the year. A movie I gave two stars. It was my lowest rating of the year. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, currently sits at a 2.3 on Letterboxd. I found this movie to be absolutely dreadful. <laughs> Horrible CGI, uninteresting characters. They turn Ant-Man into a, a bum, bumbling idiot. He's been a bumbling loser, idiot for a little while. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> he that, saved half the lives in the universe, and everyone's giving him shit. He's still. getting shit the entire first twenty minutes. Of saved this movie. everybody. Yeah, it was his plan. Let him write a book if he wants to write a book. He's paying for your rent, Kaylee. Whatever your name is. Oh my god. Most annoying dog. Cassie. Cassie's so <laughs> annoying. This movie. Also, so much hype about Kang. This is this is when Kang was getting hyped up, and then he's in this movie. And he nearly lost a fist fight to Paul Rudd. I was like, this is the guy? This is the guy everybody's excited about? And then everyone, everyone's like, oh, it's a different variant. This variant's not as strong. It's like, no, they should have shown him being a fucking badass. And I was really, I was like, all Kang did was shoot lasers out of his hand. I was like, this is it. Scream. This is the post Thanos. This is the new Thanos. Like, come on. I was, and the story was ridiculous. Paul Rudd was just like a background actor. <laughs> this was not an Ant Man movie. Yeah. This was a Cassie, Wasp, and then. Grandma movie. Grandma. 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 Janet. Janet movie. Janet. That's what it was. Michael Douglas was like, there. <laughs> he was just there. He's like, I guess I'm getting paid. I guess. They didn't even bother putting makeup on him or wardrobe. They're he like, showed up to set. He showed up. They're like, who are you? Uh, Michael. Oh, yeah. Michael just stand over there. Oh, Michael. Just stand over there, Michael Douglas. Do we have anything for, for Hank? Do we have anything for him to do? Is Hank Pym in the movie? The super genius Hank? Ah, oh, no. Don't forget about it. <laughs> Forget about Even it. Even Bill Murray was just un unmemorable. It was just, oh my God, it was ridiculous. It's a cringe movie. It's bad. It's a cringe movie. All right, that's our five worst films of the year. All right, let's get into the good <laughs> stuff. Let's get into the best, our favorite and best movies of 2023. Where should we start on the list? Should we start on the bottom? Bottom to the top. Bottom to the top. Yeah, so our, we'll end with our favorite. Oh, I like we'll that. We'll end with the favorite. I like that. All right, let's start with number 20. We have a racing movie. Gran Turismo. Oh, this yeah. movie was excellent. I saw it for the first time a couple weeks ago and adored it. And per Anthony's recommendation, I really wish I saw it in theaters because it slapped. It was so much fun. We loved the video game when we were kids growing up. We had it on PlayStation, PlayStation 2. And it's an excellent video game adaptation, but also an insane true story about this driver who was a sim racer and sim racing has become insanely sophisticated and that was the goal of the creator of Gran Turismo was to make sim racing as realistic as authentic to real racing as possible with meticulous detail and insane research on cars and tracks and racing and they pulled it off in this crazy true story of the best sim racer who went to GT Academy with Nissan Nissan. Well, they say Nissan. Nissan. In the movie. Or, or, Orlando Bloom says Nissan. Says Nissan. Maybe that's how you really say it. Maybe that's how you really say it. And yeah. he becomes a real racer. It's insane. It's fucking entertaining as hell. The music's excellent, but the filmmaking uh, by Neil Blomkamp is excellent. And man, there's a lot of practical, a lot of great driving, as well as infusing cool video game elements from Gran Turismo and just PlayStation in general. Sound effects, little designs, and then kind of cross cutting racing with sim racing. It was so well made, and I was invested in hell. And this gripping story and the emotional connection to the characters was surprisingly strong. Apparently, if you like this movie, you don't know what you're talking about. I guess. From what I've seen online. Because we enjoyed it, and people <laughs> call us idiots, basically. For real. So, I love Gran Torino. I was... I Turismo. Cried, I, no, Gran Turismo. My Gran Turino. Gran Turino. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I love Gran Turismo. I uh, I actually put off seeing it because it got mixed reviews, and then I was like, I didn't love the trailer. But then it's last week in theaters. I was like, I don't get, let me give it a shot. Let me give it a shot. I love Neil. He knows what he's doing. And so then I went, and the theater was mostly empty. It was only like maybe twelve of us because it was like the week before it came out of theaters. So his run was pretty much done. But my God, we were clapping, we were cheering, we were all crying. It was so so great, and I love a great sports movie. Um, they don't get made too often nowadays. 
And man, this hit all the right beats. Obviously, I mean, there's some melodrama. The dialogue's not great, especially amongst the kids. But once the movie gets rolling and when its strengths are on full display, it really fires on all cylinders. And it's really just straight up, flat out, an entertaining ride. I loved it. I, I was clapping at the end of it. I found it to be really inspiring, really shocking, very dramatic, um, and emotional, too. I was I cried twice, and I was not expecting that walking into this movie. I thought it was just going to be like a video game movie, but it was way more than that in so many ways, and I really adored the film. And I pick it as my most underrated film of the year. Moving on. Next up, we have a movie I was surprised that I liked so much, and that's Barbie. <laughs> Same. Barbie was fun. It was hilarious. It was... Uh, thoughtful. It was really well acted, brilliantly made by the entire production team, uh, perfectly directed by Greta Gerwig. I love the screenplay, and the cast was really, ultimately the cast was just really what made it work, and Margot and Gosling, they have that chemistry, and they have that star power. It was all around. It was really surprising. I was entertained and laughing from start to finish. It was just a lot of fun. And then it had some really cool, insightful things to say about culture and society. And it wasn't as like brutal of a bashing of men as I was expecting walking into it. It was actually pretty nuanced and had some interesting things to say about uh, the culture of manhood in America. And I, I was like, you know what? This is actually pretty good. So I think all around, Barbie was a terrific film. Sublime! Sublime! I enjoyed the hell out of it. I think the greatest strengths to it were being in Barbie land. When they left Barbie Land, it was ironically more fantastical yeah. than being in Barbie Land. It was a bit over the top when we were in the real world. Yeah, yeah. But I guess that's, you know, the script. So when it left Barbie Land, it got a little I agree. slow for me. But when they got back to Barbie Land by the second, third act, I had even more fun. You know, when Ken brings the patriarchy to Barbie Land, it was fucking hysterical. <laughs> Century City, bro. <laughs> and uh, Ryan Gosling's sensational in this movie. So isn't Greta, Gr I mean, Gre um, Margot Robbie, obviously. And I think no one could have predicted the phenomenon that Barbie would be. People dressing up to go to the movie theaters this crazy weekend of Barbenheimer. You see in a wave of pink every time you go to the cinema. It was crazy. It was awesome. I fucking loved it because we needed this. We needed this crazy event, the cinematic in-person event to bring we need that, movie theaters us. back. <laughs> <laughs> we make movies better. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Kidman um, because you know lockdown sucked and COVID sucked and people thought theaters were going to die and movies were going to die but this event was massive and it, it created that in-person experience of seeing movies in theaters with an audience how much fun it could be when everyone's laughing together and experiencing a movie together at the same time the show value to it and I think that Barbie was one of the most important films of cinema since lockdown happened it's been an integral part of the culture of going back to the movies so i'm so grateful for this movie and its success because it really is is, is an important film and which is a silly thing to say that how important a barbie movie would be to cinema <laughs> but it really is it helped movie theaters a lot it was it played for a while and i really enjoyed it i laughed my ass off and i i gotta say my favorite part is the dance number with the kens it's show stopping for me yeah dance number and then the campfire was great loved it yeah Moving on to number 18. I want to push you around. Well, I will. Well, I will. <laughs> Moving on to number 18 on our list of the best movies of 2023. We have a directorial debut from Cord Jefferson, American fiction starring Jeffrey Wright. This was a sharp, witty, satirical punch in the face to academia, entertainment, and publishing companies in the United States and just in North America, I would say in general. I think that it was insanely smart and well thought out and nuanced. Jeffrey Wright's sensational. He plays an author. He's he's a black American. He's an author, but he can't sell a book because no publishing company wants a book written from him because he writes book, books he wants to write, whereas publishing companies, they just want a very you know specific kind of black book, and he doesn't write that. And because of that, and he's pissed off of not being able to sell anything for over 10 years— and a lot of other authors who are writing very, you know, I guess you could say pandering material to sp to major corporations of what they think Americans want to read. And obviously the the 
insane white academic liberals are the people eating it up so much. Like the first person to clap is that white lady clapping. Oh, I'm so so brave, so powerful, <laughs> so true. And the excerpt. I love how read. many all the white people are saying it's so raw and honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple. It's, that was a common thing they said. And, and every and he rolls his eyes every time he hears that. There's a great scene where there's three <laughs> white people talking about how we should be listening to black voices right now, but they're disagreeing with the two black people in the room. They're like, they're what shutting you, them down. They're like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Now, the black voices right here. Now is the time more than ever to listen to black voices <laughs> as they shut the two black voices down. Exactly. So it's, it's a great. very witty and sharp and funny satire on this kind of weird culture we're in right now. And as a joke, the author, played by Jeffrey Wright, and he's pissed off, he writes the most ridiculous thing that he could ever imagine, and they eat it up. He gets a book deal, he gets a movie deal, and it's getting out of control and it's breaking up his family, and also he's going through intense trauma in his own family where he's got the loss of, of life in his family. His mother's going through Alzheimer's. So it's actually insanely relatable, even if you're not an author, even if you're not a writer or whatever, but everyone can kind of connect to this movie because the family element's so well done. It's hysterical, laugh out loud, and Core Jefferson immediately punches you in the face with what this movie's going to be with an incredible opening scene, hysterical, and I think the great irony of this movie is the people who are the target of the joke of this movie still won't understand that they are the target and they'll just laugh and clap, oh, so stunning and brave, basically, to this movie <laughs> and not understand that he's poking fun at them. And uh, I was immediately struck watching the film. <clears throat> I was like, in my head, I was like, this is the closest thing I've seen to uh, the, the next Woody Allen in terms of the writing, the comedy, use of magic surrealism. And blending all these elements together with great characters. And I was really so impressed by the film. And it was absolutely hilarious. One of the, It's probably the funniest movie of the year, I would say. It's up say. there. Yeah. Top five funny movie of the year. All right, let's move. The opening scene. Oh, my God. Is I loved it. Jaw-drapping and hysterical. I got over it. <laughs> so bold. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you got to watch this movie if you haven't seen it. Oh, man. All right, moving on to number 17 on our list is a Netflix release, May December, from director Todd Haynes, starring Natalie Portman, Julianne Moore, and Charles Melton. This was a sensational film, very strange and unique in tone, but it worked. There's, it's very weird, too, but Todd Haynes is a really specific director, and he, he, he pulled it off. So it's about this story of Julianne Moore and Charles Melton are a married couple. However... They got together when he was 14 and she was in her 20s. So it was a huge controversy and it was a huge story in the press for about a decade. Now they're living a quiet life. They're kids. They have kids and they're actually getting ready to go to college. Now Natalie Portman is play, plays an actress who is playing Julianne Moore's character in the adaptation of their life story. And so she's come to visit them for a week to research, to interview, and to get a sense for them. But things are the, the lines are between adaptation and inspiration and just research just are getting blurred and Natalie Portman's character is in a way really taking method acting act, acting to the next stage in this <laughs> film it's really funny too it's got some good comedy but it's a very interesting film and it's something that it's a move one of the movies this year that I've been thinking about a lot lately after watching it and in terms of all the films this year, it's one of the best performed by the actors. Sensational cast. I expect nominations for Charles Melton and probably Natalie Portman and Julian Moore. They could all get nominated, I could see. Um, and really, expert, very cool directing from Todd Haynes. Next up on our list, we have at number 16, Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Thing, starring Emma Stone, Mark Ruffalo, and Willem Dafoe. Yorgos Lanthimos is one of the most interesting filmmakers the last 10, 15 years in cinema, easily hailing from Greece. We love his movies, you know, The Lobster, Killing of a Sacred Deer, Dogtooth. The Favorite was his most recent film starring Emma Stone. And Poor Things was him operating with his biggest budget yet. It's the most fantastical film. The production design is astounding. Wardrobe, hair, makeup, everything looks so good in this movie. It's so interesting sharp and witty and funny the first hour of this movie is might be the funniest movie of the year just the first it's hour it's so funny it's absurdist as hell ludicrous at times 
And Emma Stone plays Bella Baxter, which I think will be a highly coveted costume this year at Halloween, I'm calling it. Oh, yeah. I expect to see quite a few Bella Baxters at Halloween 2024. And it's one of her best performances in her entire career. And she went all out for this role. And she basically plays a, uh, the, the creation of a Frankenstein doctor. So Willem Dafoe is basically a Frankenstein character and creates a being, a human, out of a corpse with Bella Baxter. However, should we spoil what's going on inside of her head? We're going to do a spoiler warning right now. Okay, so yeah. just to spoil who, what kind of a character she is, again, warning right now, what he did was he took a baby's brain and put it inside of an adult body. I won't spoil where he yeah. got the body and the brain from. And that's why this Frankenstein monster is basically starts as an infant in an adult body, but then matures and ages. And it basically is the, it shows the life cycle of a, of a human, basically, in, from childhood, at babyhood, from infancy, and, childhood, yeah. to adolescence. And there was controversy before the film came out of people thinking that, like, I saw so much controversy online of people being like, oh, this is about a man taking advantage of a woman who has a child brain in her. That's not the film. She develops and matures by the time that she starts having sex. Yes, exactly. And basically, <clears throat> Bella Baxter sets off on a journey and an adventure to explore the world and find herself... And it's a really interesting film because Yorgos, like we always say, he creates his own tone. He's a very unique filmmaker and auteur. And he kind of sort of makes his own kind of world, his own reality. It's a little different than ours. A little steampunk, a little uh, renaissance. Yeah. Very creative, very vibrant, but also dark and bleak at times as Ari well. Ari Aster said it looked like Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's a great... <laughs> It kind of does. Yeah, it does have similar vibes. Cheesecake vibes. <clears throat> but I think it's a really interesting film. I really enjoyed it. However, I, I was a little let down by the third act of the film. But I would, and Yorgos has made so many great movies. I would probably put it three or four in his career, but still one of the best this year, hands down. Yeah, and it's there's so much great graphic sex in it. I thought it was fantastic. It was so funny. There's... It's you definitely gonna be AT to see this movie. <laughs> Ruffalo is hysterical. In Mark movie. Ruffalo was my biggest surprise because he is so goddamn funny. <laughs> I love his performance. It might be my favorite Ruffalo performance, honestly. It might be too. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think so. And then I expect this film. It's gonna win. It's probably gonna win production design, costume, and then maybe even makeup. It's a favorite, not a favorite. It's a top three right now at Vegas for best picture. Really? Yeah, it's in third right now. Interesting. It goes Oppenheimer, Killers of the Flower Moon, then Poor Things. Okay. Currently. I, I could see it getting nominated, but I I mean, man. I don't think it's going to win Best Picture. Obviously, Oppie yeah. should win. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see going forward. But Killers is a, killers could win, man. Don't, don't sleep I on killers. killers winning. All right, let's move on to the first action movie of our list. At number 15, we have John Wick, Chapter 4. I'm thinking I'm back for the fourth time. Chad Stahelski and Keanu Reeves return to the... Wonderful, colorful, blood-soaked world they created with the first film. With That's a great description. <laughs> Thank Wonderful, you. Wonderful, <laughs> colorful, blood-soaked world. Thank you. That just came out, just popped into my head. It's like I can't control it. <laughs> this film was really fun. Uh, it's The action's fantastic. Car chases are awesome. Cinematography is beautiful. I love Alexander Skarsgård joining the cast, and it was a really good time. And I thought it was a perfect fitting ending for John Wick, but it looks like we're getting a fifth film. Based upon what Chahelski's Ch Stad, Chad Stahelski has been saying, <laughs> Chahelski, Stad, Stad Chahelski. I, I combine his names into Chahelski. Um, I, I wish they ended it with this film. I hope that they do because I thought it was a really great conclusion, and it's a very strong uh, chapter to the John Wick franchise. I, I still think that the first one and the second one are better. Parabellum is my least favorite, um, but this film I think was a little overhyped. I saw, I mean, everybody was saying it was the greatest action film ever and a masterpiece. It was very good, but it was a little long. And then it was a little derivative and repetitive in terms of action sequences going way too long. Although we got some great cast members with uh, a bunch of these um, Asian icons of Asian cinema, which is a lot of fun. Um, ultimately, I, I was really let down by not seeing the high table. I was like, oh, we're finally going to see the high table in this one. We yeah, have I to. was expecting high table. In and this. then we didn't get anything. We just got the son of a member of the high table. So I was just like, are we ever going to see the high table? What's going on? And so ultimately I was a little let down, but I did give this four stars. I thought it was an excellent action movie. Really entertaining. Keanu doing what Keanu does best. Um, a lot of fun action sequences and stunts. 
Um, and some good comedy, too. Overall, it was a really fun time. If they trimmed about 20 minutes off this movie, it would have flowed so much better because there was a point, like, around halfway, he's fighting his 600th guy in the movie, and I'm just like, oh, can we, like, like how long are we in this? And Keanu's good at jujitsu. We get it. We're not even close to the end <laughs> yeah. and the climax of the film. It was, a, it was a little too much. The... Um, but there were some great yeah. jokes and great humor in this. I love the stare scene. Yeah. That was such a great nod to like old silent film stars. And I, I really enjoyed the aesthetic, obviously. And, and Keanu's Keanu. He's the man. I'll watch every John Wick movie fucking any time. I still think the first one's the best John Wick movie in general. And obviously every John Wick movie, they have to expand the scope of this under underworld society. However, for me, I think it's becoming too much of an overgrowth. And it's too too apparent everywhere in the world it's everywhere you know what i mean yeah so it was i think <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> i think it worked a little better when it was a little more of a secret society but it seems to be like every street but i enjoyed the hell of it however like i said like Anthony said it's a little overhyped but yeah. that doesn't mean it's not top 15 on the year because it is yeah. I'm, and i'm sorry the the bulletproof blazers was a little too much shielding himself with the cloth yeah at first it was cool as hell i liked it at first but hey it's a john wick movie <laughs> But I wish they would have ended it too, but here we go. We got it. We're coming back again. Yeah. Still loved it. Number 14 on our list of the best movies of 2023 is Godzilla minus one from Takashi Yamazaki. This movie was a surprise sleeper hit. It, right now, it's an 8.4 on IMDb. Wow. 98% of Highest Daniels. rated Godzilla movie. This is an insanely adored and loved movie around the world. Highly successful. Made for less than $50 million US. It is just killing it. And I really enjoyed this movie. The hype was real. You know, the hype was there. Everyone was talking about how great it was. And it got me really excited about it. Because at first, I didn't really expect it to be as good as it is. Because how many Godzilla movies have there been? A whole lot. But then the hype was on a train man we were on a train ride then as soon as the movie started within five minutes i'm like this is it this is the juice this is a real fucking movie and it's currently at 4.2 on letterbox very very that's good. really high from beginning to end i was insanely inter entertained it was harrowing it was inspiring it was tragic i cried destructive i cried twice during oh a godzilla God. movie who would have thought and the cgi of godzilla was shockingly good for how low it cost it was and I love the design where they didn't go for a realistic lizard being monster. They went for... Yeah, for a realistic giant lizard being monsters, I mean, usually they they take a little liberty. Yeah, but I <laughs> love the design and the concept of making Godzilla obviously a giant <laughs> destructive monster, but then at the same time making it look like a guy in a suit. Suit motion. That's what they called it. Making the suit CGI. Motion. make it Obviously, it looked practical. It looked like a suit, a miniature at times, but it was all CGI. Mm -hmm. It was so good, and it was interesting for the setting for it to be. You obviously Godzilla has always been a metaphor for the bomb, for the nuclear weapons, and the bombings in Japan. However, they had Godzilla in the set this movie post at the end of World War II after Japan's been devastated by war, they've lost and their country's in shambles. And then how about another devastating event with this giant monster coming to destroy Tokyo? Hence the title Godzilla. Minus one, Japan is already at zero because of the war. So then we have another devastating events. Event. So minus one, that's the, where the title comes from, Godzilla minus one. I thought it was a great idea. I love the film for all the reasons you just said, so I completely agree. How about we'll run to our intermission, Anthony, okay. and then right. we'll come back and do more of our list because we have 13 movies left to talk about from 2023. But before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to obviously become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would you want to be a patron? What do you get? I mean, not only do you support the show and get Juno's cat food every week, but you get awesome perks. Every patron has access to weekly bonus episodes of the show, including... Movie episodes, but also the weekly chat is exclusively on Patreon now every single week. You also get perks like merchandise. You get access to the ad-free experience of the show, which you can link to your Spotify and listen on Spotify. You also get access to our Discord, which is a private community. You have to be a patron to enter our Discord, as well as awesome other perks going up the ladder. Custom episodes, private watch parties. Patreon is the reason we can do the show full-time. We couldn't do it without your support. Thank you so much around the world to everyone who's become a patron. Hopefully, we can break some more Patreon records in 2024. 
another great way to support the show. Another one. Another one. Is to be is to leave five star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. These are essential to the show getting seen by new listeners and new users on those platforms. We love to also read out our written reviews on Apple Podcasts from fans and listeners. They're always a great read and a delight to listen to as we read them out on the show. You're a delight to listen to. Thank you. I appreciate it. Another great way to support the show, of course, is to share us. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow organically. Share us with your family, your friends, movie lovers. Share us on Instagram, Twitter. We repost everything. Tell everyone about us. That's how we grow. Thank you so much to everyone for an incredible three and a half years on to 2024. Of course, this episode is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. We have these posters all over our set and all over our home. These are high-quality prints, great bang for your buck. They have pretty much everything you're a fan of. So, for all of your poster needs, you must go to MoviePosters.com, and don't forget to use our promo code RAIDERS10 right now to get 10% off your order today. Let's get into our intermission. I'm so congested right now. What's up with my throat? It's because we, uh, <sighs> we cleaned the studio last night. And I there was, was fine a, there when was we started a lot the episode. Of, there was a lot of dust. There was quite a bit of dust. I'm guess, glad we did it. I guess there's some still it needed, in here. It needed that. All right, let's start with the movie quote competition. Anthony, are you ready? I was born ready. Here we go. I didn't know that liking your husband would hurt this much. Huh. I didn't know that liking your husband would hurt this much. I don't know. I'll give you a hint. Okay. It was a 2023 release. 2023 release. Didn't know that liking your husband would hurt this much. Past lives. Yes, sir. He got it. They're 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 good guys. They're both good guys. They're good guys. Yeah. Very respectful guys. All right, here's my quote. Alice, tell me something true. Lying's the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off. But it's better if you do. <laughs> that sounds really familiar. <laughs> Say it one more time. Alice, tell me something true. Lying's the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off, but it's better if you do. Ah, oh, man. I feel like I know it, but I can't think of it, so why don't you just tell me the answer? That's uh, Clive Owen and Natalie Portman in Closer. That's it. That's it. Got it's a great me, movie. It is a great movie. Guess this movie release year, Anthony. When Harry Met Sally. 1989. Correct the Mundo. He got it. Oh, yeah, baby. Nailed it. I love that movie. What year did Existence come out? Oh, is this a 90s movie or early 2000s? So we're recording this on the day of Jude Law's birthday. So I did a Jude Law. Happy trivia. birthday, Jude. Happy birthday, Jude. Big fan. Oh, man, that face, man. Golden God in Ripley. <laughs> Golden God in the 90s. And the 2000s. Yeah, 2000s. And 2010s. 2000s. Yeah. He used a sex bot for a reason. And artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> He's so good in that movie. Um, it's a great actor. I, th I think I'm gonna guess '90s. I'm gonna go with 1997. '99. Ah, god damn it! Nice try. Nice try. Close. Okay, movie pop quiz time. You ready? Ready. Who directed the films Pretty Woman, Runaway Bride? Beaches and the Princess Diaries movies. Mm, good question. Whose sister is also a director? I'm gonna go with um, Nora Ephron. His sister is also a director. Oh, if, <laughs> <laughs> a man directed these. A man, man, a, man, a manly man directed Runaway Bride. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's a hit, man. I don't know. Gary Marshall. Oh. Brother of Penny Marshall. Penny Marshall, yeah. Wow, the Marshalls. Great filmmakers. Great filmmakers. I don't know why. I thought uh, a woman directed Pretty Woman. I guess I was wrong. 
it, it's, you know, nothing wrong with the, a man's touch on a... Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's a great movie. <laughs> Jude Law sex bot, a man's touch. What are you saying here, Jude? <laughs> 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 nothing wrong with a man's touch. On a movie. <laughs> you didn't say movie. On a movie. I meant like on a film. <laughs> yeah, it sounds... Sounds you want to yeah. tell us something, man? <laughs> Go ahead. Make it your moment. <laughs> <laughs> Got him! <laughs> Tape don't lie. Tape don't lie. All right. Here's my quiz question. Jude Law played the iconic actor Errol Flynn in what movie? <sighs> um, What did he play? What movie was that? Want a hint? Sure. It's a very small role. Small, mostly just a cameo in the movie. Yeah, that's why. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> thinking it was a cameo. I'm not sure, man. The Aviator. Oh shit! I forgot he's in the Aviator. Yeah. That's right. Howard Hughes' buddy. That's right, man. Mm-hmm. Way of the future. Way of the future. All right, Anthony. Do we have any unsubscribes this week? Any we sh- haters? We sure do. What do we got? We sure, we sure do. Haters besides you. All right. So I made a letterbox review of Ferrari, but I wrote Michael Manna's still. Michael Manna still got it. <laughs> so I did apostrophe A instead of S. And uh, Jimbro Baggins wrote Manna unsubscribed. <laughs> I deserve that. I got to sh- double check my spelling. And then in our best indie films of 2023 episode, Slim Knave wrote. No mention of Neil Breen's Cade, The Tortured Crossing. The greatest indie film of all time, unsubscribed. <laughs> I never even heard of that. <laughs> and then, it's Dimitri Lavender wrote, also in our indie films of 2023 episode, still no love for Infinity Pool, unsubscribed. <laughs> JK, honestly, great ass list, guys. <laughs> I like the first hour of Infinity Pool. Same. I like the first hour. Same. We have a great new five-star review. Oh, amazing. And uh, <laughs> this, this, this person's username is pretty funny. I will read it out as it's written. Rias Gremory Titty Lover. <laughs> 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 the subject of their review is Masterclass. Longtime listener, late 2020. Amazing. That's when we wow. started the show. First time reviewer. I love this podcast within each and every episode it's made abundantly clear how deep their love for film goes. They look at a wide variety of films within any and all genres, often giving the spotlight to otherwise underappreciated films. But not only that, they really make the audience feel as though they're in the recording studio with them. Aw. That's how we want you to make it feel. Thanks, Titty Lover. Every day I find myself (laughs) audibly laughing out loud at even the silliest of jokes. I truly, truly cannot recommend this podcast enough. Whether you're a film bro or someone who goes to movies once a year, a true masterclass, plus... Who let Ryan Gosling start a movie podcast with himself? Oh, Aw. Thanks, Titty Lover. Mr. Titty Lover, that's a great <laughs> review. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's one of my favorite reviews ever. Just based off the username, Titty Lover. <laughs> We're so immature still. Hey, sometimes it's funny, man. It's funny stuff. Who am I to deny them their name? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> if that's how they want to be called, they, man, yeah. Titty Lover it is. Hey, it's their name. They, they well, didn't choose t- it. It's Titty with Ds. Two Ds. Titty Lover. Oh, Titty Lover. Titty. So technically, yeah. titties aren't titties. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Streaming recommendation time. I'm going to recommend 500 Days of Summer. It is on Amazon Prime right now. I adore that film. Old Boy is finally available for streaming in America on Netflix. That's right. They just picked it up for the new year, so if you haven't seen Old Boy, check it out on Netflix right now. Good time for Park Chan Wook because they just made that deal with international sh- directors in their streaming deals, mm-hmm. so he probably got more money than he would have nice before 2023. Fuck yeah, man! Hell yeah! Which is probably why it wasn't available anywhere. He's, he's like, "Fuck y'all! You're not giving me any." Yeah, money. it hasn't been available. I mean, at all since streaming happened. Couldn't even rent it anywhere. Yeah. It's crazy. I checked four hundred four years in a row of like trying to rent it like every month. No, you didn't. Consistently. That, that's a lie. That's a lie. Not every month, but like for years I've been trying to rent that movie on uh-huh, digital. Sure. Yeah. I don't trust anything you say anymore. <laughs> when I was a baby, I came out the room and I'm like, Can you rent the old one yet? 
<laughs> it was funny in our days to confuse episode you cracked me up because you we talked about how historically that film put uh, austin texas texas on the map texas <laughs> <laughs> but you and you said yeah i never heard of austin texas till this movie came out <laughs> it's like it came out in 1993 <laughs> what are you talking about you That's didn't hear what i said you didn't hear of anything i edited the episode you said that <laughs> <laughs> you said, yeah, I never heard of Austin, Texas till this movie came out. Or until I saw this movie, I meant. I meant until I saw this movie. Fake news. <laughs> I was like, dude, what are you talking about? That episode's on Wednesday, by the way. <laughs> you, this, were, this week. You, you were three when, you, when this movie came out. I'm sure geography wasn't on your mind. No, I, I saw this movie when I was three. I remember. <laughs> and you were like, wow, Austin, Texas. What is this? Check it later, man. <laughs> check, it later, check it later. I So I just edited it, and it cracked me up when you said that. Oh, my God. I was like, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe that we get away with it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't roast you on everything you say. I mean, we, you we wouldn't have time in the day to do that. Likewise, bro. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this great video meme. It's of this. The video is of this little kid just laughing her ass off. And then the text says, when your friend mispronounces a word, but you don't let them get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like us on the show. Yeah, legit. Techus. Techus. All right, let's get back into our remaining 13 best movies of 2023. We've already done Gran Turismo, Barbie, American Fiction, May, December, Poor Things, John Wick Chapter 4, and Godzilla Minus One. Let's move into the most positive movie of the year. That's a good way to put it. Wonka. Which I was surprised at how much I loved the film. I gave it a four and a half star rating on Letterboxd. And I stand by that. This movie is sweet. It's hilarious. It's entertaining. And it's just a lot of fun. Very colorful production design. Great costuming. Wonderful score. And the musical numbers are really entertaining. Chalamet really made the role his own. And ultimately, he was just a perfect casting as Wonka. I, I love the film. It's a... Uh, Pretty average ratings on Letterboxd and IMDb with a 3.6 and a 7.1. But I think this movie... Oh, 3.4. Sorry. 3.4. 7.1 on IMDb? Yeah. I love the movie. I I had a, a great time, and I walked out just so warm and gooey on the inside. And it's just like the movie we... A movie like this is something we need. 7.3, sorry, on, the, on IMDb. Still not great. We need movies like this. Something that's, you know, irreverent. Um... And just makes you remember the good things of life. And it's about family. It's about friendship. It's about love. And most of all, it's about chocolate. Makes you feel like a kid. You know, this movie was a delight. And everything Anthony said, obviously. But, but also, I'm not a huge musical person. But I adored this film. I was dancing every musical. I was smiling from ear to ear for the majority of the film. And in a year, 2023, which... Had so many great movies, but almost like 95% of the movies are pretty dark or heavy or serious or dramatic. I think Wonka was an outlier in terms of being a hit and also being so charming and fun and sweet. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say besides I fucking loved every second of it. And I don't care what anyone says. I, I really enjoyed Timothy Chalamet as, as Willy Wonka, a character that people adore, obviously. And, you know, Johnny Depp was solid. Gene Wilder is iconic. It's a new Willy Wonka, and it's a new generation, and I think they did a really good job. It's a new interpretation of the character. It's not exactly book-accurate Willy Wonka. But, however, he hasn't gone through any in immense turmoil to make him as cynical and as hateful as he becomes as Gene Wilder's version of the character. Well, did you know that Roald Dahl hated Gene Wilder oh, did as he? Willy Wonka? I didn't know that. He hated him, and he hated the movie, too. Well, even in the book, though, <clears throat> he's a lot more serious. He's similar mm -hmm. to the Gene Wilder character yeah. versus as Timmy's. But I think this, I like this interpretation of it. And ironically, as fun as the music is, it didn't make the shortlist for any songs. The, the shortlist. Song, none of the songs made the shortlist for the Oscars. That's too bad. I thought the music was really terrific. There's really some really beautiful. good songs in it. Timmy's great. He, he pulls it off, man. And I, I fucking love this movie. Yeah, same. same Moving movies. on to number 12, we have an A24 film, I believe, the first on our list from Ari Aster, his third film. Bo is Afraid, starring Joaquin Phoenix. This is a movie that Anthony and I both feel is quite misunderstood, and maybe over time people will start to embrace it more. It was not very successful. It was not received very well critically and by fans. However, we thought it was terrific. It was a pretty early movie this year. It was back in April, I believe, it came out when we saw it. Quite a long time ago. It feels like yeah. years ago we saw this. It was, I think it was a March release. It was, it was a long 
journey into the psychosis in mind of someone going through mental illness. And I think Ari Aster's goal is to put you in someone's shoes of what it feels like to go through a, a life like that. And it was insanely surreal. The first half hour was electric. It was wild. It was insane. And it was insanely energetic. It was very funny, very creative, and insanely meditative. Joaquin's terrific in this movie. I mean, he had two incredible roles this year with this and Napoleon. I, I really enjoyed Bo is Afraid. It's not my favorite Ari Aster movie. I would probably put Ari Aster. Ari Aster. Ari Aster. <laughs> you say Ari Aster every time. Ari Aster. Ari Aster. Ari Aster. My, it's not my favorite Ari Aster. <laughs> Ari Aster movie. Ari Aster. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favorite. Let me say this like it's not my favorite Ari Aster movie. It's not like a a tape. I, like I said, I probably put Hereditary above this. <laughs> I'm dying. I'll just, I'll just stop. <laughs> Crazy ending. Crazy third act. Crazy third act. Like all his movies have. I really enjoyed it, man. I loved it. I, it might be my favorite Ari Aster movie, honestly. Honestly. And right up when I walked out of this theater, I was like fucking amazing. I gave it four and a half stars, and I was I, I've seen some people have changed their tune on it already after second watches. It's just a movie that you have to you have to watch a couple of times to grasp. But I shouldn't have to watch it twice. <laughs> what do you mean watch a movie twice? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time to watch movies again. The director should get everything in there on the first watch. <laughs> no. <laughs> This movie, I think it is. It was. It's perfectly made for rewatchability over time, and it's really impressive filmmaking. It's impressive writing. It's a brave movie. It's a ballsy movie. He's really just like trying something, and we there's. I've never seen a movie like it before, and that's what I love about movies like this. When a filmmaker who has a vision and can execute their vision. And what that what I like to think of in terms of a visionary director is they are wholly their own thing and they tr they stray away from the norm and they stray away f and they avoid the cliches and the safe ways of making movies that are so common in Hollywood and they just try to start, do something different and Ari Aster pulled it off it's fantastic I love Bo is Afraid it's one of my favorites of the year next up we have the first animated film on our list, Across the Spider-Verse, which is highly regarded all over the internet. Across the Spider-Verse is currently sitting at 4.5 on Letterboxd, and it's like an 7.8 on IMDb. This movie is really fun, entertaining, beautiful, incredible striking animation, uh, great cast, um, it's a fun Spider-Man movie. Love Miles Morales. It got me very excited for Beyond the Spider-Verse. And all around, it was a really entertaining time. Uh, Edgar Ramirez was a great new addition to the cast. I love all of the different universes that we, the Spider-Verses that we explore. Uh, the, the creativity of the illustrations and then also the design of each world was really fantastic. And using different elements and styles of animation was just a really great juxtaposition with so many great styles. The artists involved are second to none. It's probably the most impressive looking animated film I've ever seen. Um, and I really loved it. I don't love it as much as most people do. I thought it was very good. I like the first film better. I just had some problems with the story. Um, and the sound mix was bad <laughs> in theaters. Yeah, we saw it opening week. The sound mix was really bad. Opening, we saw it right early, yeah. actually. Uh, uh, but they did fix it for the second week of its release. Um, ultimately, it was, it was a really entertaining, fun time. Um, the best animated film of the year, for sure. Who's Edgar Ramirez playing this movie? I mean, I'm so fucking a Oscar Isaac. There you go. Oscar <laughs> I was like, Edgar Ramirez? And canceled. <laughs> canceled. Anthony's canceled. I'm done. See you later, guys. See you later. We got him. We Sorry. got him, everybody. <laughs> Handcuff me. We got him. He's going to jail. He's going to podcast jail, being a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Oscar Isaac. <laughs> Unsubscribed. How could you forget the man, dude? The man. I don't know why. I just in my head thought of Edgar Ramirez. It's weird. That is a weird man. They're not even. Cl they don't even look alike. <laughs> they don't. They look, like, they look kind of similar. No, they don't. They have some similar features. I guess, kind of. They both have great hair. They do both have great hair. They're both very handsome. Yeah, they're both very handsome. 
<laughs> Let's move on <laughs> to number 10 from the top 10, baby, of our favorite films of 2023. We have another A24 film starring Zac Efron, The Iron Claw, a devastatingly true story about this wrestling family before wrestling just took off and took the nation by storm. They're one of the early families, the Von Erich family in wrestling, and it follows these four brothers who are trying to make it as world champions in wrestling, as well as trying to do what their father wants and trying to win his favor and just be the, the sons that he wants in a way. And the film is so hard to watch at times because of the tragedies involved. I had no idea the story, really. I, I heard a couple of things, but I could never understand without seeing this film, the devastation that went on with this family. And I don't want to spoil it too much, but I was shocked by this family curse and how real it seems to be or seemed to be back then. And the filmmaking is excellent, excellent filmmaking for Sean Durkin. One of my favorite shots of the years in this movie. It's a triple dissolve of the three of the brothers on this on the frame at the same time. It's awesome. And the wrestling sequences are filmed ex exceptionally well. The lighting's great. The production design's awesome. Zach Efron's terrific in this movie. He really carries it on his shoulders. He's it's his best performance, hands down, not even close. And the rest of the cast is excellent. Jeremy Allen White coming off the bear, doing he's getting into movies now in a big way. Uh, this was an excellent film firm to just pop off the TV screen into cinemas. And overall, it's just a really, really well made movie. I left the theater weeping. I don't know if it's you know, we have a family of all boys, all brothers. So I really felt connected to this film. And some really interesting filmmaking. You know, there's an afterlife sequence that I thought was really beautiful. And it was, it was devastating, this movie. It, it knocked me out. Same, man. It's currently sitting very pretty with a 4.1 on Letterboxd. It's really high. It's doing really well now that it released wide. And it's doing pretty good at the box office. It made $8 million on its wide release it's the first solid. weekend. Pretty solid. Yeah, so it looks like it could make up to 25, 30 mil. The word of melt's excellent on this movie. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Now, leading into our number nine... Movie on our list, we have our guy, our main man, Tom Cruise, with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which I gave four and a half stars. I just watched it again on the plane on my ride home from Boston. Yeah, my God, this movie's just so much fun. It's excellent. The stunt sequences are unbelievable, like always, and you come to expect that from these movies and anything Tom Cruise is involved in. The cast is dynamite. Specifically, Haley Atwell and Palm Clementioff, really both dynamite, very dynamic actors. And I love the story. It's fun. I like the use of AI and technology. Uh, it has one scene that's kind of awkward, and that's like that exposition scene with all the higher ups in the government taking turns talking. But once we get out of that scene and Tom Cruise is re revealed, that movie is just up and running. And it's really fantastic. I love it. The score is great from Lauren Balf. He's really made uh, a, a great musical tone and identity for the film franchise that never really had other than the main theme. And he's created a great sound soundscape and a, a group of themes for the film franchise that I, I'm, I'm sure he's going to be making the music for this franchise for a long time going forward. Tom clearly is happy with him. And it's just great CGI, great cinematography, um, the, the, some of the stunts are some of the most impressive we've ever had. And this is a really exciting final act on the train. I just really love the film. And great comedy. Such good comedy. It might be the funniest Mission Impossible movie ever made. It's mm -hmm. hysterical, but the action is sensational. The stunts are jaw-dropping. The, the cliff jump with the dirt bike. Man. I, I've never had an experience in a theater where everyone was just waiting and anticipating this moment. Everyone was so excited about it. Full theater. We know it's going to happen at some point. Yeah. They're building up to it for like 10 minutes with him riding around these these hills in this area. And then he does it in just complete silence. When every, am I going to go down? Everyone waiting on <laughs> bated breath. It was fucking crazy. Am I going down anytime soon? Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> I love Dead Reckoning Part 1. The title obviously isn't going to stick. The next film will have a different title. It makes sense to the movie, Dead Reckoning. It's uh, calculating someone's position. Oh, okay. So it makes sense to the movie. However, Dead, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1 is a mouthful. Yeah. It really is. I think that might have hurt it a little bit. What hurt it was Barbenheimer. 
Yeah, that's true. Barbenheimer came out the week really after. Bad. Yeah, that's what happened. Barbenheimer crushed it. That's why nobody was anticipating it. It made over five hundred million dollars. However, that's the lowest performing Mission yeah. Impossible movie since four. So it's not, not great. For they're them. hoping the next one will be a lot, but there won't be a Barbenheimer in theaters in twenty twenty six. When there won't coming. be Barbenheimer ever again in twenty twenty five when it comes out. Yeah, it'll do well when it comes out. I'm I these movies they should make about seven to eight hundred million. They generally bro- break six hundred million. No and problem. it's like I mean you could compare it to the Fast franchise and the quality and storytelling, filmmaking, and acting and characters is just it's on a different level from a huge franchise like Fast X. Well, I feel like I, I love this one because the filmmaking's so good. I really enjoy 4 and 5 as well, the Mission Impossible movies. But, yeah. But in in general, from the average filmmaking scene by scene, Dead Reckoning Part 1 is superior. Just it's yeah. great movie making. It it's really is. Creative. The production's excellent. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. It's a 3.8 on Letterboxd, so very good for a Mission Impossible movie. All right, let's move on to number 8 on our list, which I haven't seen. So, Anthony, why don't you take it away? Take it away, Ant! <laughs> Once you see it, you'll be like, oh my god. It's on my so, watch list. We have The Zone of Interest from director Jonathan Glazer. It tells the story of the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoss, and his wife Hedwig as they live an idyllic suburban life in a beautiful house that they've built on the other side of the Auschwitz prison camp. It's incredible. It's extremely powerful. It's currently a 4.1 on Letterboxd and deserves that rating. It's going to get nominated for Best Picture, I, I expect, and maybe Director as well. It's expertly crafted. It's uh, really wonderfully acted as well. Uh, San- Sandra Huller, who... Uh, Samantha Huller, I'm sorry. Wait, is it San- Sandra or Samantha? Sandra Huller, I was right, who also is Anatomy of a Fall. I expect her to get a nomination for Best Actress for this. She could get Supporting Actress for this, too. She could get nominated for both. Um, but The Zone of Interest is really remarkable. I've never seen a Holocaust film like it. And it takes the perspective of the Nazis, not so much in terms of like the Nazis in the camp, but just really, it's really just isolated in this home. You never see the camp. And it's all about juxtaposition um, and and, and the contrasting ideas and images of the background of the prison camp, different things you see. You hear screams, you hear bloodshed, you hear bullets, you see the fires burning in the ovens, but it's all in the background. And the sound design is excellent. It, it's really insane. And it really showcases, like, the people who did these things, they also lived, like, in a way, banal, trivial lives. Just the home, things going on in the home, raising kids, cooking, going to bed at night. The trivial aspects of life are on display in this. And Glazer brilliantly contrasts that with the juxtaposition of the horrors happening in the background and it's a really brilliant way because there's been so many holocaust movies so many world war ii movies and he did something new with it with the genre that i never heard seen or even thought of before and i thought it was a really brilliant take on it and um there's the stories stories of this era will always be made but oftentimes i can find them pretty derivative of what we've seen before and this is definitely very fresh why don't you take us off to number seven as well Speaking of Sandra Huller, back to back, man, we have one of my favorites of the year, Anatomy of a Fall. Whoa, hold on. There's a bug on the wall. You, you see this thing? Where is it? Oh, my God. Is that is an earwig? earwig? Is that an earwig? Yeah. Hold on. Let me let me uh, kill that thing. Those are the creepiest bugs. It's from the rain, Dad. It's from the rain. Peter listening was just like, canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Anatomy of a Fall, which is a French production from... Director Justine Treat, starring Sandra Huller, who has the lead in this film, uh, as opposed to being a supporting actor in Zone of Interest. And so it's about a woman who is on trial for the murder of her husband, who died under unseen and suspicious circumstances. He was found at the in his backyard, having fallen from the third story of their house. Nobody was home. I mean, she was the, the wife, played by Sandra Huller, whose name is Sandra, she was asleep in her room when he fell, and their son was outside of the house walking the dog. So there's no witness. And so the whole film is the investigation of whether she killed him or not. And there's a lot of suspicious evidence, and then there's evidence that takes makes her innocent. And so it's a fascinating exploration and examination of marriage, of relationships, and it's also a cool courtroom drama. 
But it's not it's not a, like a courtroom drama movie. Like uh, half of the movie is all character and the home and family dynamic, and then half of the movie is the courtroom. So, and the screenplay is brilliant. I hope it gets nominated for director, screenplay, and lead actress, and best picture. It's that good of a movie. It's it's in my top five of the year. Um, and it's it's really fascinating because. It takes the perspective the, between the prosecuting and the defense. It's like, and the, one of the main themes is in a relationship. There's two sides to a relationship, obviously, and you know, if it's a, if it's a complicated and conflict uh, conflict heavy relationship that's not working, you know, one person will look at the other person as a villain, and that the other person will look at this person as the villain, and. You know, everybody can look bad in the eyes of someone who doesn't like them anymore. And th- th- that's a, a common theme in the film that's explored really well in the courtroom scenes. And when evidence is pouring in against her, it's, it's all like circumstantial and opinion and perspective based. But it's like, man, you can see how the court, a lawyer will try to, they try to twist a narrative as opposed to using evidence to try and get a jury on their side in both sides of a case. And that's really well done in this film. Ultimately, it's a powerhouse performance. I think Sandra Huller should win Best Actress at the Academy Awards. Wow. Absolutely. She's, it's riveting. It's a profound performance and one of the best of the year. And it's, it's, it should win um, for the category of Best Actress. Amazing. Let's get into number six in our list. We have from the goat. One and, of the sorry, goats. it's a four point two on Letterboxd. Four point two. One of the goats, David Fincher, his latest film, The Killer, on Netflix, is so goddamn good. And this is ironically, even though we loved it, his worst reviewed movie. It's the lowest in, on By IMDb. Audiences. Yeah. On IMDb, it's his lowest, I believe, on Letterboxd. It might be his lowest too. And I just don't get it because this movie is so well made, so well acted. An awesome take on an assassin adapted from a graphic novel. Fastbender is terrific in this role as this no-named assassin who basically we get to see the day-to-day life of a hitman and the boring parts of it and, the like you were saying, the trivial aspects of what it's like the day-to-day, the, the little intricacies and how it would be like a day job for somebody. It's really fascinating to get that kind of perspective of a hitman, of an assassin, an international killer. Fastbender's excellence. It turns into a story of revenge after he misses a shot for the first time in his career, which we can assume has been for decades. And the people who hired him eventually start to come after him to clean up the mess. And it's about him trying to find the people who basically run everything and take them all out so that he can save his girlfriend and save his own life. So well made, so well crafted. Fincher is a legend. We love the guy's movies. See, everything he does, we're, he's one of our all-time favorite directors and filmmakers for a reason. And I love the aesthetic. I love the tone. The last three movies he's really made, you know, they sort of all have his new, his, his solidified a style he's made besides Mank. You know, Gone Girl, Dragon Tattoo, and this, I feel like, are his most similar movies to a style that he's created throughout his career that he's happy with right now. You know, in the past, in the 90s, movies are a little different than they are recently. But I think he's found his his tone and his look, his coloring, his cinematography, his style. Is, it's really locked in into what he wants and what, what he likes. And I think that's why his last several movies have been all so strong and consistent. And I, I really love Fincher. It's a 3.5 on Letterboxd, and it's his third worst reviewed movie by audiences. On Letterboxd? <clears throat> yeah, Mank and Alien 3 are below it. Damn. Damn. Um, I love The Killer. I thought it was so fun. And it was really entertaining, and it was funny as hell, and it had a really like extremely brave opening of sixteen minutes of narration with no action happening. I thought it was like I was like smiling during the film, yeah, during the opening, and it's it's it. I get audiences haven't really responded to it because there are some commonalities that we've seen in many other movies, especially assassin movies. But the thing is, <clears throat> it's an assassin movie. You, you there are gonna be similar beats that we've seen before but it's a matter of like every story has been told before but can you tell it in a new way and you can make can you make it fresh and exciting and um something we've never seen before and i think he did absolutely i mean i've seen many assassin movies i've you've seen many assassin movies we've seen them all um so you could, there are going to be similarities similar scenes that we've seen before 
So I, because a lot of the negative reactions I saw online were saying it was cliched and same kind of scenes we've seen before. But I'm like, that's all storytelling. Everything's been done. But Fincher did it in a new way and with his incredible precision as a director. I adored the film. I loved it. He's one of the best filmmakers, if not the best right now, at making his movies feel like the world we live in with consumerism, with behavior in production design, stuff like that. I mean, the amount of corporate consumer products in this movie that we uh, interact with on a daily basis. I love it. It's so real. Yeah, the use the of Amazon, Amazon stuff, the oh searches. I'm like, this is our, this is how we live now. And I think people, people got upset about all that. I'm like, what are you talking about? It makes us feel so authentic and real. This is like, if you're really a hitman, an international assassin, you're fucking getting Amazon packages. Oh my God. Yeah. All the time. I thought it was brilliant. Honestly, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. All right, let's move on next. Now we're in our top five. Oh man. Of 2023. <laughs> These are the heavy hitters. Number five on our list, we have a new holiday Christmas classic, The Holdover, starring Paul Giamatti, directed by Alexander Payne. We actually just did a Discord watch party. If you're a patron, you got to watch with us, and we watched The Holdovers with a bunch of people in there. It was a lot of fun. For them, for several of them, it was their first time seeing this movie, and they found it delightful. This movie's so well made, so well crafted. It feels like a, a time machine. It feels like it was made in the 1960s or the 1970s with obviously contemporary technology. The cast is excellent. It's a story that you, you brought up the other night. It felt like Dead Poet Society. It's the closest thing that's felt like Dead Poet Society since that movie came out. And it's about this academy, this this boarding school in Massachusetts where the Christmas break is coming up. So obviously all the kids get to go home for two weeks. However, every year there's a couple holdovers, a couple kids that get stuck there because their parents either are busy, don't want them to travel, or just don't want them home. But they're... They don't want to tell him that. So they're stuck there, and every year there's a handful. Paul Giamatti plays uh, one of the teachers. He's just a hard ass. Nobody likes him. He's a great teacher, but he's insanely difficult. And there's five kids about that are laying over. They're holding over. But then in a hysterical joke, this fan fantastical dream of, oh, I wish someone would just get me out of this situation. I wish a helicopter would come and find me away from this horrible situation I'm in. A helicopter comes and takes all the kids away except for one. Because one of the kids' dads runs a helicopter company. And no, he's a CEO. He's the CEO of a helicopter company. No, but just of a company. Okay. And then the, <laughs> I thought it was... No, he just has a helicopter. No, I thought it was a helicopter company. I don't think it's a helicopter company. I'm pretty sure it is. Well, it might be, yeah. I think it, it actually... Could be. I think it is. All right, maybe it is. Because he flies it himself and everything. And no, is he has the... Oh, he has a pilot. Wild Bill. Wild Bill. Pilot. But I'm pretty sure it's a helicopter company. All right, might be. Anyways, so unfortunately, the lead character's name is... um. What's Angus. It? Angus. He is the only kid who can't go on this helicopter ride because he can't get a hold of his parents and all the other kids go skiing. So now it's stuck between Angus, our teacher, and the, the Mary. cook, Mary, the cook Hunt of the school. The teacher. Hunt him the teacher. Who are the three of them just stuck together for Christmas break. And it's about their journey together, specifically Hunnam and Angus, how they don't get along. They hate each other's guts. Angus is one of the best students, but... Everyone hates Hunnam. He's got issues. They both have issues. He's a Scrooge character, yeah. but they really bond over this time period together alone with doing all these things together. It's just really hysterical, really well written, so well made. I fucking love this movie. It's a wonderful film, and it's delightful. It's funny. It's charming. It's whip smart, and the char it's really it's all about character, and the characters are so well fleshed out, so well performed by all three, and I just I adore the film. I saw it twice in 2023, and it's, and it's in my top five, without a doubt. It's really, it really is that good, and I was not expecting it to be that good. Um, I knew I had high hopes because I love Alexander Payne, but I was like, the movie was over, and you and I turned to each other. We were like, that was fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. it's that it, it really is. It lives up to the hype. So check out the holdovers if you haven't watched it. It's only available for renting right now, and it's sitting at a 4.2. On Letterbox, it's really high. Absolutely for Letterboxd. crushing. Really high. Absolutely crushing. All right, next up, we have a film that I think is one of the most impressive directing outings of the year, from none other than Bradley Cooper, Maestro, which tells the story of Leonard Bernstein, his music, his professional life, as well his his relationship with his wife Felicia and their children, and their personal inner lives. I found this film to be so profound and astounding, uh, incredible filmmaking, just unbelievable. Like Bradley Cooper knocked me out with A Star Is Born, but like this is like 
this is on another level in terms of the artistry. <clears throat> Excuse me. And his performance is so goddamn good. Carrie Mulligan is amazing. I mean, she's, oh my God, she's so wonderful in this movie. And then Bradley is just, oh my God, otherworldly as Leonard Bernstein. It really felt like the man, it was the man and not the actor playing the man. And that that conducting scene of Mahler in the church, it really is like one of the most incredible sequences of the entire year. And I mean, Bradley's getting some hate online for being like, people are saying he's overacting in it and and doesn't deserve it. I was like, dude, what are you all talking about? This is one of the craziest things of acting I've seen this year. It's unbelievable. Um, and he put a lot of work into it. He put six years of prep into this movie and it really paid off because he was super believable. He really did conduct uh, the London Phil Philharmonic or Orchestra in this film. Like he really conducted them. Um, there's a great chat between him and Alfonso Cuaron. If you want to check it out, they did a Q and A the other day. It's a really fascinating discussion. Uh, there's another Q and A with Steven Spielberg and, and Bradley, and it's a great insight into the direction and his choices and motivations. And the movie is just really special. It's got so much um, fantastic, so much fantasy to it, uh, surrealism to it, um, and it, it's there's so much incredible filmmaking in the first the first act is so like magical and fantastical in its direction <clears throat> and then it slows down and the filmmaking kind of matures with Leonard until we're almost like observe observing Leonard and, and it really is what surprised me most about the film is, is so much about the marriage and the marriage took the front seat to the conducting and the composing which I think worked better because it wasn't a typical biopic that we're used to. We're used to like, okay, is the greatest hits of their life, <clears throat> the conflicts of their life, yeah, whatever. It's like a, a super cut. But this was like, it was an examination of the marriage and the family. And I thought that was a brilliant way to attack the story and present Bernstein's life to us as audiences. I agree. Let's give Anthony a break because his voice is... My voice is... I'm he's, dying. He's losing it. He's losing that voice. I'm still not over my illness. <laughs> his illness. You call it your illness. It was an illness. It was I'm an barely... Illness. I'm lucky I'm alive. <laughs> Let's move on to our top three of our 2023 list. At number three, we have an A24 film written and directed by Celine Song starring Greta Lee and T.U. Yu. We have Past Lives, which was a beautiful film about romance, about life, starring Greta Lee, who plays a character, this this woman who, in her childhood, moved from South Korea, Seoul, South Korea, to the United States. And when she was in South Korea, she had a friend, this boy, who, you know, they would have probably ended up together if she stayed in South Korea. However, because she moved to America, she has a new life. She's adopted her lifestyle here and the culture of her America. But while she was going to school and everything, she stayed in connection with, with this boy from her past. His name is Sung, and she plays Nora. And they try to make it work, and it's an insanely relatable movie to anyone who's been in a long-distance long relationship, especially with those old MacBooks, Skype, those sound effects. <laughs> so relatable. <laughs> Anthony needs terrible sound effects. That sounded just like the Skype incoming sounded, call. I don't know what you were doing. Um, <clears throat> close enough, though. I'll give you that. A little bit. It was uncanny. But it doesn't work out between them this long distance because he won't commit to moving to the United States, and she's committed to her life there. And she falls in love and meets an American man and marries him. And then later on, eventually, he comes to visit, and the film is an exploration of the life they may have had or could have had if they ended up together, sort of just feeling it out, then it, it. I like how there's no intimacy involved in this movie, really, between the two of them. It's just a connection that they had, and they're exploring that connection because we all have a past life or past lives. If we stayed in a specific relationship, if we stayed in a specific city, if, if we made different decisions in our past, what would our life look like? Obviously different than the one we have. And this film explores... The idea of of thinking about that and, and sort of approaching it, and do I want that? And whether or not you accept it or not, 
And as he comes and he meets the husband, they sort of have these, at first, seem sort of awkward conversations, but at the end of the day, they're really important for all the characters because they all sort of get closure from these past lives that could have been in past relationships. And it's a beautiful movie. It's so well filmed, 35 millimeter. It's a great New York City movie. Oh, yeah. There haven't been that many lately, but I think this is up there, and I felt a strong connection to this movie. Agreed, man. It's an amazing film. Sure is. Absolutely astounding. You're an amazing film. Thank you. I gave it four and a half stars on Letterboxd, and it's sitting at a 4.2. One of my few five-star <clears throat> movies this year. All right. Do you want to take it away with number two, just because I'm losing my voice? You good? All right. Number I'll, I'll add in a little bit. <laughs> number two on our list, we have the GOAT in his latest film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Lily Gladstone, and Robert De Niro, based on the true story of the Osage murders in Oklahoma in the 20th century. A shocking true story, backed up by excellent expert filmmaking. Martin Scorsese is the best ever. Still doing goat He's things. He's a living legend. This production is astounding. The filmmaking is exceptional. Well, obviously, we knew it was going to be a banger. But I, I, did we expect it to be one of his masterpieces? I'm not sure. But it ended up being one of his masterpieces, hands down. Everything about it, from the production, from the acting, the screenwriting, cinematography, the score, the music, everything is done so well. It's a master class. You know? he, he's an expert. and it, It's insane. At his age, he's still innovating, still doing new things, and still creating the best pieces of cinema every year almost. You know, we always talk about how Scorsese, he may have made the best movie every decade that he's been making movies. Oh, yeah. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2000s now. This could be the best. It could be one of the best movies this decade for sure. It's a, oh, it is, it's yeah. A front runner between this and Oppenheimer for best picture, obviously. I think it'll go either way. But, you know, Martin Scorsese is Martin Scorsese for a reason. In De Niro, it's one of his best roles. He plays a very despicable but likable character at the same time. It's a very complicated, nuanced role. Lily Gladstone, this is a an insane coming out party. You know, she's this is her biggest role ever, and she's gonna be a superstar after this. And she's a favorite for lead actress at mm -hmm. the Academy Awards right now. And I would not be surprised if she won. And, and DiCaprio that. gives one of his best performances ever. Hundred percent. Absolutely. He transforms in this movie He's like remarkable. he hasn't in a while. Like the Revenant kind of transformation. And I, I really loved Killers of the Flower Moon. Obviously, we saw it on IMAX. It looked terrific. And Scorsese's... It's fucking Scorsese, man. It's one of my two five-star ratings this year. And then it's sitting at 4.2 on Letterboxd. And like you said, Scorsese, at his, in his age, he's still pushing boundaries and still creating new ways of making movies. And it's got two of the most exceptional shots of the year. I think it has the best shot of the year, the fire. The fire is, oh my God, with that extremely long lens. And my God, what an image. Like, I was like floored by that. And they went back to it twice for good reason because it's that good of a shot. And my God, I mean, it's a long movie, but it's worth it. The runtime is two hours and six minutes, but man, honestly, it flew by. Three hours and six minutes. Sorry, 206 minutes. So it's... Three hours and 26 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Did I say two hours or yeah. 200? <laughs> you said sorry. two hours and six minutes. 206 like minutes. It's way more than two hours. Yeah, it's way more. But it's honestly, it, it whizzed by, I think, in my opinion. It sure did whiz. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to take a whiz when you watch it. <laughs> but I was absolutely floored by it. It's an unbelievable, incredible, extraordinary film. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be this and Oppenheimer for Best Picture. And to no surprise to anyone listening, and... Those of you at home, we have Oppenheimer at our number one as best film of 2023. I gave it five stars, and it has a 4.3 rating on Letterboxd. It lived up to the hype. It's a masterclass of filmmaking and of acting. Christopher Nolan is a shoe in for best director, finally, for the first time in his career. Is I he... had a dream that he didn't win. I mean, it would... I, I just realized I had a dream last night that... Christopher Nolan didn't win. It would suit what's director. happened in his career so far of not getting recognition as a director. Um, I think, honestly, I think he's, he's going to win all the awards as director. This should win Best Picture. It should win Best Cinematography, Best Director, Best Lead Actor by Killian Murphy. Profound performance. He is incredible. It's, I think it's the most impressive performance of the year by anyone. 
And it's really, the movie hinges on him, and he's nothing short of exceptional. It's the best thing he's ever done. Yeah, Oppenheimer is number one. It's obviously no surprise here on Raiders of the Lost podcast. You all know how much we loved Oppie. I saw it four times in theaters. I did three times in the first week it came out, but then I did when they had their first re-release on 70 mil about like two months ago. I saw it mm-hmm. when you were away doing something. And then they're re-releasing <laughs> it in January this month on the 12th 70 millimeter format. So if you haven't seen it in 70 millimeter, we cannot recommend driving a little bit if you have to to see this in 70 mil. It's an astounding piece of filmmaking. It's so powerful. And, I mean, the guy's career is so insane. Christopher Nolan, what a legend. What a guy. And he's coming out with a movie like Oppenheimer, and it just blew me away. I can't believe how good it was. Well, I can, but at the same time, it's, I didn't think he'd ever be able to top his best movies ever. But I think it's his best movie after seeing it four times and not trying to have recency bias be in effect. But, my goodness, it's just fucking amazing. What a trailer, too. What a everything. What a trailer. The and the cast, score. The cast is so huge and epic and excellent. And I think everyone was expecting this to be a, a best movie of the year. And it really lived up to expectations. But my fucking God, he set the bar high and made almost a billion dollars at the box office. A rated R Crazy. film about the creation of the atomic bomb. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Everyone's excellent in this movie. It's, it's the best movie of the year. Best movie possibly of the decade and maybe the best movie of the century. It's one of the best episodes we ever did, our, our review of it. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. It's our, it's our number one episode. It is. It was a banger. It was a huge hit. And obviously, if you want to, check it out. It's, it's Please available. Please do. Yeah. yeah, we did two and a half hours on it. Fuck yeah, we did. No, I think we did 240 on it. Something. Two hours and 40 minutes. I edited that one. It took a while. <laughs> he spent three weeks on it. <laughs> <laughs> He's still editing it. I still am. All right, and we have a couple honorable mentions. These are films that almost made the list. Number one is Napoleon. Really fucking enjoyed this movie. However, it didn't quite make the top 20 of the year for us. Then we have The Equalizer 3, which is one of the best action movies of the year. Denzel's the man, still kicking ass. In his final role as so The Equalizer. Good. So good. And then Ferrari, which almost made this list too. We just saw this the other day. Such a good racing movie. I really enjoyed it. It's up there. It almost made that cut. But I think we put Gran Turismo ahead of it just because... It was something it was pretty unique, I think, to the racing world. Grand Turismo was just so fun. Yeah. So fun. Ferrari was excellent, though. If yeah. You see it in theaters. It's, it's playing right now. Yeah, I gave it four stars on Letterboxd. Me too. It was, it was a really good time. Michael Mann's a legend. And that wraps our best and worst movies of 2023. What a year. What a fucking year. It's the best one since 2019. It's the best year in a while. Yeah. Maybe since 20, yeah, 2019, 2017 was excellent 2019 as well. was lit. 2019 was lit. Thank you so much for tuning in to Raiders of Lost Podcast. This was our first episode of 2024. Wow. So excited to be here with you all on our almost fourth year of the show. June will be our four-year milestone. We're so excited to be here with you. We're ecstatic by the support you all give us. And many of you have been listening and watching since day one in that first year in 2020. Touching. Wouldn't be here without you all. So thank you so much for your support. Become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. If you're watching on YouTube, it really helps the video. Share us with your family and friends, and take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.